So officially welcome. My name is Tim Campos, Director of Recruitment Programs and Outreach at Art Center College of Design Admissions. I'm excited to have you all with, uh, with us this evening. Um, and I also wanna uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, some of my colleagues uh, at the college who are also have made tonight's uh, conversation possible. And so uh, tonight's conversation is uh, D by three dialogues and diversity and design. It's a series uh, in collaboration with Art Center Admissions and the Center for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion in Art and Design at Art Center. And so we're more than excited to have you all with us. I uh, also wanna thank our, our co-sponsors, the Departments of Illustration and the Department of Fine Art um, for co-sponsoring this event um, for our first uh, digital uh, virtual series. And tonight's uh, artist we'll get to in just a moment, I'll introduce him, but I also wanna uh, briefly uh, pass over the virtual mic to my colleague, Liz Lanfear. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and, and thank you so much for Patrick um, for sharing your time with us, sharing your studio with us and sharing your story with us. Um, you know, it's so important that um, we see um, a variety of artists and a variety of people and hear all the stories that brought them to where they are. Um, and that's something, you know, that um, DEI prioritizes um, and, and we wanna make possible for everyone to kind of um, share lived experiences and um, share their own personal stories. So thank you so much. And, and you know, echoing what Tim said, Tim's such a great um, collaborator excuse me, collaborator in this, um, in these events. And, um, and then also thank you to Fine Art and um, Illustration. We really appreciate it. Um, so follow us on, um, uh, we're Art Center DEI on Instagram, um, also on Facebook. And that's where you can find a lot of um, these event updates. Um, and then also your Art Center email. Thanks, Liz. And so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Patrick momentarily. I wanna give you a little bit more background about Patrick and who he is. And, and uh, I won't take away too much of what he'll be uh, speaking with us all about. But also I wanna remind everyone who's, who's joining us today is we have a really nice mix in the audience. Uh, we have uh, members from the Art Center community, including staff, faculty, and current students. We also have a handful of prospective applicants, some recently admitted students for our spring term. And so definitely across the spectrum, we have a lot of different people in the audience today. And so I, I, I'm really excited for you all to hear from Patrick. Um, but without further ado, a little bit about Patrick Martinez. Patrick was born and raised in San Gabriel Valley here locally. Um, his LA suburban upbringing, his diverse cultural background, he identifies as Filipino, Mexican, and Native American, provided him with a unique uh, lens through which he interprets his surroundings. Influenced by the hip hop movement, uh, Patrick cultivated his art practice through graffiti, which later, later led him to Art Center where he earned his BFA with honors in 2005. And we'll definitely talk a little bit more about that, that experience as well. Uh, throughout his facility, uh, throughout, uh, through his facility with a wide variety of media, including painting, neon, ceramic, and sculpture, Patrick colorfully scrutinizes otherwise everyday realities of suburban and urban life in LA with humor, sensitivity, and wit. His art often serves to celebrate leaders and thinkers whose work resonates strongly today, in addition to memorializing victims of police brutality. You can find Patrick's work featured all throughout the US and internationally, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Minneapolis, Miami, New York, Seoul, the Netherlands. He has shown in a variety of places, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, the Vincent Price Art Museum here locally in Los Angeles. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, LACMA, he has works in the permanent collection at LACMA, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Crocker Art Museum. Um, and also the Museum of Latin American Art, among others. Uh, so uh, in 2021, Patrick will be the subject of a solo museum exhibition at the Tucson Museum of Art. And currently Patrick is living and working here locally in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna go in and ask uh, Patrick to join us on stage. Hey guys. Um, hey, Liz, uh, thanks Liz and Tim for um, the intro. Um, I don't have slides today, so we're just gonna hang out in my studio like if you guys were here. That's what I've been doing um, when I do uh, these Zoom kind of um, presentations. I think it works out better. Uh, that way it's kind of different each time, you know, like uh, there's things going on um, that are um, different in my studio every week, I believe. Um, 
you know, um, I think I, I work pretty immediate and fast. So there, there's a lot of like, you know, different things happening. Sometimes like last week there was, you know, kind of, a, um, um, you know, kind of downtime, but I'm, I'm glad that you were, we're doing it today because there's actually some things to see. And um, I am here, my studio is in Huntington Park, Los Angeles, and it's just south of downtown Los Angeles. I've had studios in Los Angeles ever since I've got out of Art Center. Um, and um, this is where I'm at now. I've been here for about a year now. And I've been just kind of working on shows and things coming up. Um, um, and yeah, just trying to break, you know, just pay great attention and, and work out, you know, um, shows and, and, and things I said yes to, like, you know, six months ago, a year ago, just, just working those things out now and, and making sure that they get um, done and um, presented in the right way. Um, so yeah, I graduated Art Center 2005 and, um, you know, I've been working ever since, um, like, you know, small kind of uh, illustration jobs straight out and then design work, but I've always been working on my fine art. Um, on the side, I always kind of knew that I had to support it. Um, but yeah, I'll take you around the studio and then uh, we can kind of just figure out um, what we want to talk about. And what I have behind me is, um, let me turn the camera around. This is a, um, the, a piece that I just finished. It's about, well, I finished it probably in June, July. And it is, I think it's 16 by eight feet. And it's kind of the combination, the, the kind of what I'm doing right now with like a sculptural kind of paintings. Um, I look at these as landscapes. Um, so I start out with a base kind of idea and painting. And what I started out with was this kind of uh, central um, Mexican mural. Um, I was thinking about brown bodies and walls and you know the this you know those this all these talks about walls and and kind of like breaking down um, those walls of time and then bringing stripping that a uh, figure or figures from central mexican murals from you know in the past ancient ancient art and just stripping that and placing on the side of a stucco wall um, the side of a market and you can see like the textures. Um, I mix like a stucco paint in there and I kind of roll it on with uh, paint rollers. And I use a lot of different materials. I'm using spray paint, I'm using uh, house paint. I use a lot of um, uh, ceramic. These are all handmade uh, ceramic roses. And um, I make them all by hand and then, you know, we cook them, I cook them. And then um, I don't use traditional kind of methods to color. Uh, the ceramics was I felt like the colors were kind of drabby so I uh, use spray paint and um, like Tim was saying um, a lot of like what I'm doing with the materials that I'm working on off of now are using things from the past um, i.e. spray paint and um, what I wanted to touch on that was the spray paint when I was using that when I was 14 years old I was thinking about that really like during, um, you know, like the last three years about how that wasn't used to make art, you know, that was kind of a thing that you bought at the hardware store. And now we can find that at, you know, Blick and all these other uh, places, you know, with a full range of colors. So um, thinking about materials that you're not supposed to use to make art. And this is what this is. This is all I know about painting and sculpture and all this stuff I'm using, um, um, you know, I look at these as landscapes, but also I think about the changing landscape. So for lease signs, I'm thinking about banners and banner tarps as canvas stretching that across the panel. Thinking about like, you know, traditional canvas and panel kind of ideas and how they're put together with this rabbit, rabbit skin glue and canvas on top of the panel. But then using that as like a, you know, almost like a, a collage element and then painting a you know, a mural of Malcolm X. I'm thinking about, I'm think, thinking about a landscape with this, these pieces, but not just one place, but like four or five different places in combined in one. So I'm thinking about somewhere like in, uh, you know, 
Lawndale or something, or like, you know, like on the, on the West side, uh, they might have a mural of Malcolm X, um, somewhere on the East side, they might have a central Mexican kind of, uh, mural, Mayan mural, ancient mural. Um, and, you know, just combining those, um, and trying to create this like third space for myself, you know, me being from a mixed background, I'm always trying to combine and, you know, like, you know, really see the connections and really pay close attention to how things are kind of um, interwoven or like the connecting kind of fibers. So I'm trying to find, you know, opportunities to do that. I'm also using kind of archive photos from my family. This is my grandfather and his friend in Los Angeles and another picture of my grandfather and my cousins from my mom's side using uh, LED signs. Some are bought, some are kind of uh, programmed. These are kind of like, you know, we started getting into movement of the LED signs, getting them programmed to say certain things. For me, this is kind of like a still life, you know, like um, the elements that you see painted here. I painted this the beginning of quarantine or the shelter in place. So I was thinking about um, things that were desirable, hard to get instead of, uh, you know, things like Coca-Cola, chips and things like that you might see on the side of a liquor store or thinking about um, other things that people are trying to get. Um, so more photos, archive photos, um, just, just showing like, you know, since this is a LA landscape for me, this is like kind of like showing the lineage of, you know, brown bodies in Los Angeles and they just so happen to be, you know, my great grand, you know, great grandmother, uh, aunt, and my father and my mom. Um, so my mom was a from the Philippines. So I'm kind of like, you know, it's, it's weird because my, my father has been here for a long time and he's been in LA for a long time. And my mother had just came, you know, arrived from the Philippines in the seventies. So, um, and then, yeah, just like a lot of the banner tarps that I'm like, you know, creating, buying, finding all that stuff using, um, ceramic tile that you find in the city, but I'm using it like in a different way, like, you know, kind of thinking about how the sun beats down on things and um, things get broken and they replace. So I'm thinking about when I'm putting this together, like Aztec and Mayan Jade and how those, those masks kind of and, and artifacts look. Um, and, you know, like yeah, if you've ever been to Mexico City, you go, go to, um, um, the uh, museum there um, and, and you just see all kinds of artifacts from uh, different uh, civilizations that kind of inspired me to kind of look um, in Los Angeles and create like, you know, think about art as artifact. Um, um, so yeah, I'm just thinking about all this stuff. And the reason that I'm doing these ceramic roses is because it's about uh, street memorials. Um, the reason these, 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 these photos are blue, cyan is because I'm thinking about the sun them being there for a long, long time in the window and then uh, bleaching the, the photos out. When you see a poster in the window somewhere and it's been there for a long time and it's a kind of a four color process, the last color you see is cyan. So I was thinking about like a cyan type. So yeah, I'm just, um, you know, doing work like this and it, um, these are like landscape pieces for me. I work big typically when it comes to this, um, these kind of uh, pieces. Um, you could see my studio here. Uh, these are the kind of materials I'm using. Using a lot of spray paint. I'm using pressure washers to wash out. Um, what I'll do is I'll paint all this first, you know, the stuff that kind of, sometimes uh, I'll work at different speeds. It's fast, slow. Um, I'll slow down on the portraits and other things, and then I'll paint over it and then wash out certain areas. So you can see, and I'll just do that constantly. So I wash it out with this, this pressure washer use spray paint to, you know, think about community aesthetic. This is what a lot of this is. Thinking about security bars as sculpture. It's another idea of community aesthetic. Things from the community that I'm piecing together to create this kind of idea. And in that, I'm thinking about uh, labor and like people that paint out graffiti, that clean up the city, people that decorate the city with graffiti, the, 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 the plus and minus, you know? Kind of like you would, you know, load your brush up with paint and then, you know, to, you know, kind of uh, wash it away with water. It's just like, that's my reducer, I guess. Um, I use, um, 
you know, all this stuff, spray paint, different tips, uh, rollers, um, ceramic tile. Um, older pieces around here. These are some cake pieces that I worked on for a uh, mural in Boyle Heights. Um, that'll be up soon, sooner than later. They'll be printed on tile. Um, it kind of interests me because I was already working in tile. So I look at this stuff as sculpture too. There you see a rose, the roses again. And the same materials, it's just a uh, laser cut of uh, gold, um, gold uh, acrylic. And then I'm painting with um, a froster and, and heavy duty acrylic. See the froster here. I think I still have some paint here. So I'm thinking about different ways to apply paint. Um, thinking about sculpture, thinking about a lot of things when I put the, I use a lot of uh, house paint, but then specifically I'm getting stuff mixed, but then also thinking, or when I go to Home Depot, I look in the oop section and get like colors and just kind of work on, with those and mix, mix different colors to get, you know, shades and try to match, you know, color. And I know that it won't match. So like, I, I think about that store owner that's trying to paint out the graffiti on the side of, you know, of his business and he's not gonna get the correct kind of uh, color match. You could see that kind of shift there. But think about like temperature switches, like uh, temperatures changes in the color. It's banner tarp and sign. This one's already boxed and ready to go. Um, here's a, um, an example of uh, the neon uh, sculpture that, that I'm doing. This is all inspired by, you know, uh, mom and pop kind of uh, storefronts, them advertising businesses like tech, uh, checks cash, income tax, laundry mat, uh, ATM, whatever. But I'm remixing the messaging and this is uh, Thoreau. That's a new one I just got. So I'm just kind of making sure the lighting is good. I'm working on some new pieces. Um, they're, they're really raw. I mean, they, these are the underpaintings. Um, they look kind of crazy to me right now, but um, you know, I have to build them up and then I wash them out. I paint paint over them. There's layers that are that's put onto them. And um, you know, I'm using just different uh, materials. It's kind of like add and, you know, mix colors. And um, what I'm gonna do with this is just like, you know, most of this piece will be white and then I'm gonna like kind of uh, eat away at the bottom. So it's like kind of like this, revealing like little bits of color. So I'm trying to do like, you know, create some kind of rhythm or a symphony of color for the underpainting and then paint over it. Um, this is kind of a newer direction I'm moving in. It doesn't really, you know, working with the Plex and breaking it and using it um, as storefronts. And I'm gonna be using like particle or fiberboard for the, to cover most, most of it. There's not really much to see there, but I'm just kind of working on that, um, just a new, uh, like I said, the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, um, Central Mexican murals, um, thinking about those on the side of, you know, places in LA, you know, uh, markets, um, you know, liquor stores, anywhere, like a business that might have uh, commissioned someone to paint this. And then the layering of it, the changing of the landscape, the, what happens after a certain time when someone buys a property, what color is it? Like thinking about the layers, like I would think about if I cut a tree um, and I saw the tree stump, how many like, you know, how many rings, you know, are there? Like, you know, it, it's about time. These, these pieces are a lot about time, these landscape pieces. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of uh, random stuff here. I'm just getting ready for next year and should, you know, uh, story of my life is just uh, kind of uh, making sure the uh, shipping is right and make, making sure things get, uh, you know, while I'm working. I like to work on a few p pieces at once because then I can kind of, um, you know, get a rhythm going. And then it's just kind of like uh, slow down on one or focus on one. But yeah, I mean, that's that's literally my studio. My, my office is in there and this is kind of this setup. Um, and I t sometimes I'll go outside and uh, wash, like I said, with the um, pressure washer, I'll wash uh, pieces outside. 
So um, I think that's about the 20 minute tour. I think that we only had like 15 minutes or something, Tim. Yeah, so now uh, it'd be a great opportunity to go into uh, the, you and I can have a conversation and I have a couple questions that I've been wanting to ask. And then also we'll go ahead and open it up uh, in just a bit to our sure. audience. I'm sure they have questions based on your studio tour, but then I guess uh, for me, I, I kind of want to start in the beginning, kind of have a middle, and then we'll talk more present day. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, we have uh, people uh, with us today, folks with us today who are members of the Art Center community, faculty, staff, current students, but then we also have a handful of prospective students who are thinking about Art Center and just thinking about art in general and yeah. how that's relevant to what they're doing today. Um, but also I think because your work is so deeply rooted in your uh, cultural upbringing, your community, I kind of want to start with kind of, uh, did you always see art as, as a pathway for you? Like in your early days, kind of what, what kind of even put not just art center for you, but more so what gave you the notion of like, I see art and design as a, as a career path or even just as a path for me? Yeah, I was lucky enough to have that kind of, um, you know, that kind of, uh, I wouldn't say foresight, but just kind of that, that opportunity to just kind of work at my own pace. When I was very young, I was drawing and I felt like I was drawing for a long time, just like, you know, like I would spend hours and hours just drawing. So that kind of bolted me into just, you know, continuing that and not even like really listening to anyone about like, oh, that's good. Or you should keep on doing that. It was like more like I wanted to see what I can do or like more I wanted to um, push myself. So I would copy everything and, you know, anything really cartoons, uh, comic books, things like that. Uh, when I was a kid and then when I was a teenager or 12 or 13 years old, I got into graffiti. So I picked up probably spray paint before I picked up paintbrushes. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, that kind of like, it was always there. It was never, a, there was never a time that I stopped. I, ever since I could remember five, six years old, I was always drawing. And um, so like, it, it kind of just evolved naturally or kind of organically into what I'm doing now, kind of um, informed by things from the past, things that I picked up when I was a teenager, things, in, you know, the language, the uh, the attitude, like they just kind of like you know the uh, the scope um, is all kind of informed by um, you know like the the you know kind of lens that I'm looking through. Um, when I was doing graffiti and stuff, it was kind of adding you know even though some people won't say it, it was adding to the landscape or or doing things that. Um, made you look at the landscape differently, different angles. And, um, you know, like it was just observation. It was always something I was doing, observing, and I was always into that. So I was always there and it was something that I wanted to push through and do for my, um, for probably, you know, for, for the rest of my life, I think. And I knew that probably when I was in high school. And would you say, you know, I think today it's, it's, it's definitely, not that it hasn't been important. It's, it's always been important. But I think today it's, you know, we often hear about, you know, students who are kind of navigating, figuring out, you know, is this an option for me? Um, and I, I know that there's a great value and importance to having your your support network and whether that's your family, your chosen family, your network, yeah. or those who are supporting you. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What was that like for you? Kind of what was that support system that you relied on that, that just kind of pushed you even further or when you made the decision like, hey, I'm going to actually pursue this avenue of, you know, the, the, the avenue as an artist, which I think sometimes there's that connotation that you're going to be a starving artist. And then we like to sure. kind of get away from that and talk more about, well, what were some of the things that you kind of saw as, well, it doesn't have to be just that. And maybe how you navigated that path um, with, uh, based on, on the support system that you had in place that you created. Um, the support system was there here and there. My mom never really understood kind of what I was doing. Um, she, she got it. She was just kind of like, Oh, that's nice or whatever. And my dad, was probably tripping out because all his, you know, my grandfather painted and um, sculpted, um, you know, just kind of for himself and all my uncles drew and painted. So he was like, wow, it's like, you know, I was a kid and he would put 
Um, that's one thing was my father, he would put like pens and pencils and paper in my hand. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, you know, um, him doing that and then like him, you know, I'll ask him how to draw something like, you know, like not that he really knew how to draw, he just tried to draw. So it was more like um, that was really helpful, like early on. Um, and then when I became a teenager, 11, 12 years old, it was more social and I was doing art. It was about, you know, and I wasn't a social person. I was super quiet, super shy. Um, I think like in elementary school, they thought I didn't speak English, you know, so they put me in ESL. And then my parents got pissed off and they're like, oh, he, all he knows is English. So they rip, ripped me out of there, put me back in, you know, the regular classes. And that's how shy I was. But when I got to be 11, 12 years old, I became um, social in this subculture of, you know, graffiti. And it was about uh, producing art. It was like, you know, that materials that you're not supposed to use to make art and making it on the wall. And then that wall is, you know, public, you know, not that everyone can see it but people are gonna see it. So you want it to be good and you're, you're doing all this research and stuff. So it became social real quick. And then, um, you know, I probably stopped doing it when I was 20, 21, but it informed a lot of my, you know, um, you know, a lot of the material choices that I'm using now, but, um, and then, you know, you see hints of it in the work, but, um, and then I went back into my lab and just started making work. And then I went to art center. So the support system throughout was more family first and then friends pushing me to make better work. Um, but then it became about me challenging myself. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's definitely a hard thing to do. They make it super impossible, you know, like super just intense and, and hard to uh, be a practicing artist in you right. know, America. And, and I think two, two kind of follow-up questions that as, as, you're, as I'm listening to you speak, uh, one was kind of what was that that time frame from when you finished high school and then I uh, you spent some time prior to coming to Art Center. Kind of what was that time frame before you actually found yourself at Art Center? Um, yeah. And, and within that, what what even put obviously your your San Gabriel Valley, but kind of what put Art Center on your on even as on your radar as as a, as an option? So the the thing about it is, I grew up in uh, Pasadena, um, so. That was in the, in the 90s, you know, I was born in 1980, so I'm 40 years old now, but in the 90s, very different. Um, I was going to Pasadena High School, and they had a visual arts and design academy, which was like excellent. Like now that I look back more towards it, it was another thing that wasn't social. It was more just by luck of the draw, like they just started this program at my high school and everything, art was intertwined. So I really lucked out with like things kind of lining up and challenging me. But anyways, I went from passing to high school and I was already, I think 17 years old, 18. No, I was 17 years old. And me and my friends would take nine classes at PCC. And I, we were pretty good. Like me and my friends were pretty good. 17 years old, we were like, you know, burning a lot of the, the adults in the night class. And they're like, do you, like, you go here? Like, yeah, like, oh, we're, we still go to high school too. So that was probably, the bridge, you know, um, passing a high school um, to PCC. And then that's how, um, well, actually I learned through, um, learned about Art Center through the Visual Arts Design Academy at Pasadena High School. Cause they, they ended up giving us uh, leftover classes from Saturday High. And I was 15 years old going to those. Another reason like I lucked out and started seeing like quality of work, like craft, like high level, you know, and um, at 15 years old, and I was, you know, still doing graffiti and thinking about that, but then seeing this whole kind of serious side of school, um, and you know, it looks successful. Like it's like, wow, this is really prestigious. Wow. So when I was 17 years old, I started going to PCC with friends, 18, 19, 20. And then um, I, I uh, applied to Art Center, but. I was in a PCC experimenting and honing the craft maybe two, three years. And then I went to okay. Art Center. I, uh, I applied in 2001, got in and, you know, and started 2002. What would you say, because uh, there's, you know, I, I, I know we have current students with us and we have prospective students too. Um, just in terms, you know, Art Center can, can be a demanding uh, place with the curriculum, but I'm curious about 
maybe for you as an artist, someone who was aspiring to do your next step in your journey and, and your trajectory, maybe what, what was one thing that you, you noticed about yourself once you came to Art Center that maybe was like a learning curve? Because I think all of us as artists, there's that, you know, there's, there's something that, that, that speaks to us that we have to maybe like either rethink what we know about art or rethink what we, uh, what are our perceived uh, ideas about the art that we make or whatnot. So for you, maybe was there, was there an aspect of your art making at that time when you entered Art Center, you kind of saw like either evolve or that you had to, to kind of question what it was that you, that you were doing or how you can do it differently. Kind yeah. Of, however, like, where you want to take that. <laughs> yeah. So like, I feel like my foundation stuff, like when I was at PCC, the artists, the teachers were just kind of like, you know, um, you know, that had, I had, um, um, guys like, you know, like, um, Stan Kong, he was, he was more technical and showing like, this is kind of the level that you want to be at technically to try to get into art center. Then there was teachers that kind of just said, Hey, do whatever you want. So, you know, it kind of, it kind of like was, was cause you know, the, that was the spectrum. So I kind of was developing technical skill, but I still had my own kind of touch. And um, once I got into art center, it was all foundation stuff and, you know, painting and rendering. And we're specifically talking about like, you know, European easel painting. And it's not anything about like, this is 2001, 2002, right? Right. We're talking about just kind of like rendering in the, you know, kind of um, not rendering, but painting and like an old, you know, kind of like, all, you know, um, a la prima paint, head painting and figure painting and, you know, uh, drawing with uh, charcoal and trying to get gestures down. And so it really kind of, um, you know, I, I, I made that, that, that kind of, I got acclimated with that stuff. I, I, I did the work, um, you know, the mileage was there, but then after, you know, maybe six or six term, fifth, I was always thinking about the work um, that I wanted to produce because I knew that maybe I didn't want to do some kind of, you know, work at Disney or something like that. So I always wondered like where, where, what kind of work can I produce? Or like, I'm, I'm into doing, I want to do work that I want to do, you know, and like kind of, kind of add to the conversation that way and not just kind so of was like it, mimic things. So was it at Art Center where you kind of, because your work is, is so heavily derived from your cultural upbringing, your identity, and it's yeah. definitely, I mean, I look at your work and from the neon sculptures to the, the piece you were showing at the beginning of your studio tour. And I definitely get the sense, like if I didn't, if I didn't know you and know your work, I automatically have a place in my mind of where it's from, um, you know, given mm -hmm. from within the Los Angeles community. Um, yeah. And so for you, how was it, was it throughout your time at Art Center that you started to see your, your, the art you're producing evolve? Did you come into it with it and it just expanded and you took it in um, that direction? or I was I was messing with it like I was painting cops police brutality the first peachy folder I did was at art center that was 2005 I drew it as a silk screen so I was dealing with that type of um content that was 2005 but the teachers the teachers some of them were cool with it they're like oh they're tripping you know like they were like oh interested in it. and some were they, they just weren't um versed in that language they thought it was, you know, I couldn't get a, you know, not that I was trying to get like the ultimate critique or anything, but it was just like, they didn't know the language that I was speaking. They thought it was, right. we're post-racism. All these issues that I was working on with my work, it was like, I was like going, like I was almost kind of like schizophrenic because I'm like, yo, this is really, like this is something that I've seen happen, but you know, like, some of the teachers would just be like, oh, I don't really get it. Or like, you know, so, you know, I mean, obviously now it's probably totally different 2020, right? Like there's a lot of things that we can talk about, but I was, I was pushing the work then, like, you know, I, the content I was painting, like, you know, my brother, my friends in my neighborhood and things like that, uh, Tupac and different, you know, so my work looked a little different back then. And, um, I was trying to push for it, but I, it was just something I could only get it from a few teachers that that critique or that kind of feedback, or they did maybe just didn't know where 
um, it, it would live. Like they were just trying to be, you know, honest, like maybe they didn't see it in the gallery because there was nothing invented yet, or there was, it would yet yeah, yet to be there, or they didn't know the artist or the artist to kind of connect to this work or kind of like that, that is in dialogue with this work. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something that I did and I wasn't really shy about it, even though I was like, I wanted to make it, but I totally felt that time where I felt, um, you know, like I wasn't producing the work, um, they wanted me to, or just kind of like, it wouldn't, it doesn't fit. Um, and I get that a lot, you know, like even now they go, Oh, you went to art center. I'm like, yeah, I went to art center. And they're like, Oh, okay. I didn't know that. And so, um, well, I, I think it's, I'm glad you speak about that because I think it's refreshing to know that even, you know, whether we talk about 2005 or to talk about 2020, which we all know 2020 is in itself belongs, belongs on its own and its own uh, reference. Um, yeah. The fact that you talk about like, even back then, the, the relevant themes in your work that's present today. I mean, one could say like your work back then, not that racism has gone away, it's always been there, but you're, you're bringing some of these topics to the forefront and putting in a part of your work. And just from, from then to now, definitely just continue evolving. Um, so I, I definitely think it's, it's in a, in a way, it's what I said about being refreshing that knowing that back then, you're already pushing the boundaries of like, this is the work that I wanna create, whether whether your instructors at the time thought it was relevant or they didn't engage with it or, or understand it, the fact that you kept on pushing it and that's got you where you are today. Now we look at your work, I look at your work and I'm sure there's many who are with us uh, today virtually who look at your work and think like, you know, this this is work that, that you know, the type of work that you were producing back then. Um, yeah. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to take. I'm being mindful of the time, but there is an important, uh, important uh, piece of work that you reference that I just wanted to, to talk a little bit more about, which is the Peachy series. And so to hear you talk about it, how that kind of developed during your time at Art Center, and now to see where it's at today, can you talk a little bit more for those of you who are who are tuning in? Um, the Peachy series. Uh, one of the images here is is on the on the bottom corner here with George Floyd. So can you talk about kind of how that series itself has evolved and. Uh, where it's yeah. at today. So, so that, that series started at Art Center. I started probably drawing it in one of my classes. Um, the idea, probably like um, Clayton, the um, Rob Clayton, like the Clayton yeah. Brothers class. But also I was messing around with Roland Young. I had Roland Young. I, was, I broke out of the, art, the, the illustration kind of program and started taking like other classes. I was in Roland Young's class and I developed their that idea there too. So it was kind of like a back and forth, but um, it was just about things that I remember happening in high school to my, my, my friends, my family, um, you know, like during summertime, you know, friends in my neighborhood would get put into police cars with the heater turned up, you know, and messing with them, the cops messing with them. And, and uh, they would mess with us when we were just walking, you know, home from school. So the idea of youth and authority, cops being at high schools, you know, like why are there cops at high schools and just knowing that and then also flash, you know, flashing back to when I was in elementary school, it was like, just say no to drugs, McGruff the crime dog, dare, um, you know, all these kind of like, you know, cops showing up to our school and everyone thinks like, oh, they're so great. And, and then being betrayed later on because they're cursing at us and they're calling us names. And, and I was like, wow, this, this is kind of ill. Like, this is crazy. And then you hear it in rap music. And so I just wanted to really like, try to like, um, I always thought like, you know, to try to like make work that just like is not really decorative. Like I wanna, I think that there's, there's, there's validity to being decorative and there's like a beauty to that. And I like doing it sometimes, but then there's also times that we just have to speak a little bit of truth. And that's what I was trying to do with that. And I felt like that I needed to speak something, um, you know, something just honest. And when I started with that drawing, um, it was generic. It was some kid getting chased by a cop, um, other cops, you know, um, doing, I think slamming another cop, uh, slamming a kid against the car. And fast forward 2014, 15, I started painting them again, or now they're paintings, but now we have images and we have video and we have stills that I can slow down. And it was every week, constant. So I started wanting to cement these happenings 
um, you know, in the context of a peachy folder, which is, if you guys don't know, a peachy folder is something I had in my youth and we used to keep them in our backpacks. We used to fold them up and put them in our back pockets. You could see them in Saved by the Bell, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, things like that. They were just kind of like this American scholastic folder. And I, what I wanted to do was update it. Um, so I really updated it in 2015. I noticed the guy that was ch uh, choking, um, um, well, actually Walter Scott that was running um, and getting shot, that was kind of like, um, you know, the track kind of um, a scene in the original Peachy folder. And um, Eric Gardner was getting choked out for selling cigarettes on the corner and the detective was wearing a football jersey. And he was like, it looked like he was tackling him, but obviously choking him. So I was like, oh, there's, you know, there's different connections that I was trying to make. And then I started painting them. And then I think I had, and then also finding old folders, because, you know, these existed, um, they still do in different colors, not the original yellow, like you see on the screen. But then I started drawing on them like I would in high school or middle school and people used to draw on them and then um, do like, a, you know, the idea of like, you know, what if this guy, person doodled on a folder, you know, what would he draw? If, like, what, what was he, what is the, what is, what is the youth learning right now? Is it, they, they turn on the TV, it's, you know, um, you know, George Floyd getting killed on, and lynched on TV, you know, like what, what, what is, what would they be drawing on that folder? And, um, you know, different, different situations that you see play out. And then it's all and, on, you know, television. And this series so it's something that I wanted to reflect. It's something I wanted to reflect and and paint into importance because these people um, that are victims of police brutality, the black, brown, whoever, they're not gonna build statues and monuments for these people. They're not gonna paint uh, pictures of them. They're not gonna build bronze statues of them. So I wanted to do that kind of work initially. I, I was gonna mention the, the powerful nature of the Peachy series and how it's evolved because I myself didn't even realize that it kind of started in its iteration during your early, early time, uh, as you mentioned, back to your years at Art Center, but then even developed to where we are today. And I know that you've, you've taken this collection into like an installation now where I've seen it, where you have like actual school desks, you have the peachy folders, they're displayed. Um, yeah. So really making sure that youth are understanding um, the, the context of what it is that, that, that we're going through today. And I think it leads, yeah. um, lead, that, leads that, that kind of to the next- That shows actually high school, yeah. Right, yeah, and and then I've, I've noticed you have it currently uh, show uh, showcased at a high school, and you have it uh, other places as well. But I think it segues nicely into kind of one of the other areas that it, um, on the topic of kind of what we're going through. Not uh, again, racism has has always been systemically a part of of every aspect of of society. It's just I think uh, this year more so than ever we're coming up with this, this current racial reckoning that we're experiencing in, in America. And, and how do you see art? I feel like we can't have the conversation of art without tackling systemic racism and, and vice versa. We can't talk about systemic racism and not talk about art and kind of the connections there. So how do you see whether it's either your own art or just art, contemporary art in general, contributing and leading into that that conversation of where we're at currently with race in America and, and the importance just overall of, of, of what that means for either this racial reckoning, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, all these different pieces that, that, that we're all seeing uh, on a daily basis in the last couple months um, and how it's getting us all to kind of rethink our spaces, rethink what we do. Um, and then for you as an artist, rethink kind of the direction of your art yeah, I mean, um, there's parallels in the art world, you know, between the systemic racism and kind of like, you know, like I want to like a lot of artists want to be, they're good, you know, they're good, solid people. They want to be useful. They want to be um, heard. They want to be seen. They want to be useful. They want to take up space. And uh, art is a way of doing that. They produce art that helps organizations, whether that doesn't really physically say it. Um, maybe they're donating a lot of their, you know, like those proceeds from a couple sales to it. Um, they're doing it and it needs to be done. Um, but there's a lot of parallels, especially with the black and brown artists in the art world and uh, making uh, room for those artists in the, you know, so-called white cube. Um, 
a lot of them can relate to a lot of the things that are going on. So they, they, they I think they, um, they riff off that and it becomes evident in the art. Um, and just, you know, wanting to be represented on an even playing field, um, you know, and not be, you know, like a lot of collectors think that, um, you know, like black and brown art or brown arts, you know, like right now, they think it's like, you know, um, naive identity art. It's like, oh yeah, you know, and then, you know, um, whatever. So navigating this whole terrain of like fitting in or kind of like adjusting and fitting in and kind of finding your place in the art world if you're brown or black or what, there's parallels. So a lot of it is triggering. And I think that a lot of it comes out in the work, like I said, and it's totally, um, cathartic to see at times it's like you know friends and um you know they'll post work that kind of like uh, that encompasses all that and i think that it's important definitely and i think uh you know for you know anyone who's who's with us today who who might identify as latinx or a black yeah. indigenous person of color knowing that your art matters and just as patrick shared you know the importance of work that you're producing that maybe someone might understand or question, well, why are you doing that? I don't get it, I can't connect with it. I think makes it even more important as to why those stories needed to be shared um, as well and, and being able to, to provide those, those outlets, but also for someone else to see themselves within your work. And, and I'm, I'm more, um, uh, I'm certain there's, there's, again, either current students with us or prospective students are thinking about Art Center. Who are, who are hearing you talk, Patrick, and, and seeing your work and seeing themselves and aspects of your work, because again, the, the work that you're creating is not only relevant for today, but it's definitely drawing on your, your lived experiences through your identity. And so um, I wanna be mindful of, of time. Okay. And, and at this point, um, you know, spend the next 15 minutes or so and, and take questions that might be for sure. the audience. I had my, my time with you to ask questions and I wanna pass it on virtually um, and, and take questions from the audience. So. Liz, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll manage the uh, the uh, the visuals here. But maybe if you want to open up the uh, the chat and see if we had any questions that came in, and then anyone else, if you have questions at this point, is perfect opportunity for you to um, to uh, unmute yourself and ask away. But first, uh, Liz, we'll, we'll go through the questions first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Patrick, for your tour, and and thank you for speaking of your work. Um, yeah, you know, so many powerful moments there. Um, Ruth O'Connor um, was asking. Um, she says, beautiful work, Patrick. Thank you for sharing your space and work. Um, seems your work is focusing on reproducing your environment and visual memories of specific parts of your life. I'm guessing this is, wasn't always your focus or maybe it has been. Can you talk about how your themes slash focus in visual arts have changed throughout your career? Um, I guess that's a good question. I mean, like, uh, I feel like I have different bodies of work, but they all kind of like some people think I'm all over the place, but I find there's a common thread for me. I think that they're all kind of analogous, but um, in that, like the landscape work has only evolved in the observation. Um, you know, like I'm observing different materials, different things that kind of come up in the city. So even though the, the, um, the uprising, right? Like George Floyd protests, that's gonna affect what I put in my next piece, which, which is happening right now, because not only just like, I'm gonna paint a portrait of him, that's not what I'm doing. I'm, the materials that go up on these businesses, on the, in the landscape, the, the physical landscape changes. So that's how it evolves. You know, I'm not really, I appreciate artists and I have lots of peers that are very talented. And, you know, a lot of people ask me in the interviews and stuff like, oh, what artists are you looking at, this and that. I, I look at a lot of art, but they're not really informing my work. It's observation that informs it. And that observation changes every day. And the city reveals things to you um, almost on, on the daily that you haven't really seen before. So in that, I'm kind of picking up on things and trying to pay, um, um, you know, close attention and pick up on that. Um, like I said, the changing landscape, um, materials, things like that, that's going to change um, my work um, in, you know, in, in the physical kind of material sense. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, th in that sense, um, you know, that body work changes. And then even like with the ongoing peachy folder series and the, the neon work that I'm doing, a lot of it has been, you know, um, the, the messages in the neon are more uh, warning signs and um, reminders. And there are kind of been taken into the digital realm. They're like, you know, in social media, and now they seem to be digital protest signs that people kind of repost and things like that. So um, the language in that changes, right? And, you know, um, messing with that medium is, is thinking about um, what's things that are, you know, in some of the neons that I was working on, like things that aren't working in this current administration or like, you know, in, 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 in in, in certain kind of ideas, like I'm redacting text and not, you know, making things light up and work. So that's kind of like a new thing. And, you know, it's just, it changes with, with this kind of like current events and things that, uh, that I'm seeing. Because in all of this, I'm thinking about, like I said before, art is artifact. And I'm thinking about making work that reflects the time that we're living in. So like everything is kind of up for grabs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Um, and then um, Betty Avila is asking, um, and I know you've worked with some high schools recently, so I'm curious about um, how your peachy work um, is received by students who might not um, <laughs> have peachy folders anymore, or you know, who yes. are largely in the digital space um, for the most part of their uh, high school careers. Um, what has been the student reception from you know, like the more recent students that you worked with? Yeah, the recent student stuff that I did at Harvard Westlake, which is one of the most kind of wealthiest high schools. I mean, obviously um, they're pretty up there because they have a gallery that they could have my work in. Um, I try to pre pre represent the context or just represent the peachy folder. So on the desk that, um, I don't know if you saw installation photos of that, I put the original peachy folder um, on the desk and then I have it in a drawing, a new drawing that's framed so they could kind of see it, they can hold it. If they go to the show, they can understand that it's a folder. Um, I try to explain it in the talks and um, I think they get it. You know, they just understand that it's like this past version of the United States or like America that I'm updating and remixing. Um, they see the, the, you know, the, the 1950s illustrations of like, um, you know, youth um, having an amazing time running track playing football, basketball, all that stuff. So they get that idea and then they, they understand, I guess, how I'm subverting it. And they, they understand the, the vocabulary that I'm using in terms of the portraits and the figures because they're seeing it. So that's super new, um, you know, but it's, it's something that's, it's, that's in their visual vocabulary already. Absolutely. Um, so they're responding to it. Okay. Yeah, when you place it in that context, it puts it in such a, um, like you said, like universal, you're automatically back in that moment frozen in time. Um, and yes. and you, you, the visual language immediately translates to something related to school um, and what you might doodle during school. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Um, people are really appreciating your work and especially your time. So, um, you know, oh, yeah, I'm here. Really that. Yeah. No worries, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then um, we have um, someone, Ayuka, um, asking, do you have any advice for artists starting out and wanting to be professional artists? Um, yeah, I mean, it just, just ask yourself, where do you want to land, I guess, or where do you see yourself? Like, if you see yourself in the gallery or if you see yourself in a commercial kind of, um, you know, making work, for studios and things like that. Those are two different paths, you know? So you would have to, um, I don't know, like what, what, what it depends on where you imagine yourself being and fine art, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you could possibly do to, you know, really get honed in um, and look at a lot of art, go to museums, go to shows. Not that the things are open right now, but when, when hopefully when things reopen or um, now you can look at books and things like that and really kind of understand people's um, way of making work and then understand that you have your own way of making work and what do you want to add to the conversation um, of this time or the contemporary art. Um, 
and you know just work at your own pace i know that's a luxury um, especially when you're trying to make money pay bills pay your student loans but uh, in that case i knew that i had to support my work so i got different jobs to support it illustration jobs when there's still magazines in 2005 and working on different album covers and you know just things to pay bills and then i took you know worked at agencies for a couple of years but i still supported my work and i let it develop on the side so i don't know it's just trajectory like where do you want to land and um you kind of have to take the steps in the direction of that you know if you want to play baseball you have to go to you know, baseball field, and um, try, try to do some things, uh, work, you know, um, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a slow, you know, for fine art, it's, it's definitely a slow burn. Um, it's going to take time. Um, but um, it's all delayed gratification. And in that, you're going to be um, kind of developing your own kind of uh, language and your own um, touch. So, um, I don't know. It just depends on how you imagine your work or where, like, where, where do you want to, like, do I you see yourself, you know, in a studio working on your own stuff or do you want to work with people and design or so it's, it's about that. And then, um, but in any of that, you, you have to add to the conversation um, productively, I guess. That's great. That's great advice. And in a unique uh, way. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. And then in the authentic way, like you were saying, I feel like, um, you know, the conversation be, be, between your, um, you know, younger self and the art that you were making there and the conversation that you are having now with the art that you're making are the same conversation. It's just different iterations of that, almost like the layers of yeah. your painting. It's like those parts that you're removing and that you're clarifying and that you're iterating, um, you know, all of those layers are really apparent in the, you know, continuing it's all authentic to your experience, um, you know, and that's that's really evident um, in your work. And that, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and then like you know, making work too. This is a good, there's an urgency there too, you know, to make the work for me. Mm -hmm. Like I want to make it. I want to make something, um, you know, kind of appear out of nowhere and like make it exist from a thought, you know, and that's kind of magical for me. So I kind of go in and I make it happen, and then sometimes it, it comes out all right, and sometimes it comes out great or whatever, and um it's a receipt you know mm. it's a receipt and it's just something that i want to um have take up space in on a white wall or some gallery space or hopefully a museum whatever i want it to exist as an object or a thing that uh speaks and vibrates um you know so there's for me there's an urgency to make yeah um, uh, so I wanted to give, you gave a shout out to Stan Kong. Um, and I yes. think, did he, he was here. <laughs> and oh, yeah. I don't, uh, yeah. He emailed I don't me know yesterday. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. He's wonderful. Um, I, yeah. I love yeah, that. We have you a, quite a few are... faculty with yeah. us today, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you mention um, Clayton? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. Rob yeah. Clayton. Robert he, Clayton, he's also here. Lots of, lots of feedback in his class and the room and space to make things that you know you want to make um you know it's not figurative it's not observational it's you know what are you what are you going to make if you're not you know copying a model i know but, um i know some people yeah. might be dropping off as we hit the hour we'll, we'll still have uh, for, for a couple more minutes for some, sure. some additional questions but um just to remind folks um if you have to go you want to see more of Patrick's amazing work. He has a lot of content um, on his Instagram. So uh, Patrick underscore Martinez underscore studio, I put in the chat box. And then also at the same time, a plug for Art Center DEI. You can follow uh, our Center for DEI and learn about more upcoming events, including additional events from this particular virtual speaker series. But Liz, we have, uh, we have some more questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Laura Cooper. Um... Our fine art department chair who's yes. co-sponsoring this event with us today. So thank you, Laura, so I don't know if you wanna, if you have a question, if you wanna uh, come up with your, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask away. I uh, Thank you. Um, Patrick, it's been really great to hear about your work. And um, there were a couple of things you said. And so this isn't exactly a question. This is just me expanding uh, a little bit for the sake of the students and soon to be okay. students audience. Yeah. I think I love what you said about not producing the work teachers wanted. 
And I think that it's kind of like the essence of what being an artist is. And also for everyone who has been in a classroom where there was an expectation of a kind of work that wasn't essentially your own, that one of the things about being an artist, about deciding that what you want to be as a fine artist is that you have that urge to make and that um, you can understand that your teachers have subjectivities just like you do, but that you are going to stay true to your vision. So I just want to say kudos to like the development of your work from school to now. It's really, yeah. uh, it's really impressive. And I, I love that you said just that, because I think that especially young people need to hear that. Yeah. And I understand where they're coming from too, with the illustration department and because it was, it was about, um, you know, like um, finding something where you can kind of like get out of school and, you know, push. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's definitely like, you know, it, um, like anything you have to kind of fight for things that you want to say or just, you know, um, develop that, that language. Well, you're doing it beautifully. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Laura. Do we have, have any other questions, Liz? We do. We have um, a question that came through. Um, someone was wondering how much you use studio assistance and in what capacity? What does that look like for you in your process? For studio assistance? Mm -hmm. I have one assistant and she just takes care of most of my emails and I still have to kind of, um, you know, uh, chime in. Um, my brother helps me from time to time lift things. My, my, um, my friends will help me. Um, but in terms of like the neon stuff, I have a fabricator that's in uh, commerce, not, not far. And uh, he'll make the pieces and we'll assemble them here. Um, some of it, he'll just kind of finish off there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a back and forth. I don't have too many people here. It's just mostly me. Um, and you know, it's, it's my assistant. She'll come in sometimes, um, but mostly just working on, uh, email stuff and there's a lot of zoom calls and things like that these days um so i'm on those but then my assistant is also but physically like at the studio there's no one really just like my neon guy ramiro and then we kind of um, assemble these pieces like the one behind me this is something that he wouldn't understand um kind of like what i had kind of thinking about so i just kind of get um like i need like a piece of uh purple neon that's 16 feet and he'll put it together and then I have to kind of install it and wire it from the back and he'll help me too. So that's the only real kind of physical, but plus I have like my brother help me and my, my friends uh, when I have to do some heavy lifting. And then um, Sebastian was wondering, I'm curious about the neon. Sebastian, do you want to go into more detail about what you're curious about with his neon? Oh no, he just said he had a fabricator and I was like wondering how yeah. he was cool. Yeah. So I design I design a lot of you know, I design everything on the computer um and then get it fabricated. But um a lot of it too is kind of it's a different kind of mode or um speed because you have to slow down and measure and things like that. It's the last thing that kind of goes down on something like that. Um and you know, it's 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 something that you have to kind of try out like got to think about it and kind of have like a vocabulary of the color neon colors in my head and I got to kind of figure what um what I'm trying to um say or what I'm trying to replicate the feeling of certain uh spaces yeah and yeah. so um interesting the intentionality of leaving some words illuminated and others um you know uh off essentially um and do you mind talking a little bit about because some of I mean I see two different um I mean a, a visually different representations of your work this like very layered um you know mm -hmm. like um uh you know like th so you can see the underpainting you can see the layers you can see the sure. work and then the neon is so clear and clean um so it doesn't have the appearance of um, iterations, even though it probably does have iterations, they're just hidden. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like how, how do you get to the point in which you are ready for like the final neon process and are there iterations involved in that? Yeah, I mean, they're just sketches on the computer, um, just comps that I kind of comp up and 
And if it really moves me, something I read, something um, that I, you know, kind of come up with, I'll put it down and figure out um, a color combination that really speaks to what I'm doing. I just did a neon that's getting fabricated now that is inspired by a Kirk McCoy photo. And he took a photo, uh, he took uh, many photos during the 92 uprisings. And um, there was um, kind of messaging, just kind of like, it feels like echoes, right? Of like uh, this year and then 92 of messages that are spray painted on businesses that were burning um, and I took that message and um, kind of took the colors from that photo and, um, you know, kind of implemented them into that piece. So that's kind of like the things that go down. And it's just more kind of like a slimmed down version, kind of minimal, kind of straightforward. And the, the fact that it is so straightforward is because it comes from um, mom and pop advertising. So it's straightforward. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with, um, you know, like advertising you might see on a billboard, but this is just a community kind of aesthetic. And I'm thinking about um, the messaging that goes in them obviously, but then also when I made, when I made the first one in 2008, I wanted it to be that rectangle with the text in it. So with the black plexiglass, I wasn't trying to be sexy like Tracy Emin and you know, it was more direct and I wanted it to look like you can take it and put it in a liquor store then take it out of that liquor store and put it in the gallery. So it was, it was everything that you would see in a neon sign in a jewelry store in downtown that said 24 karat gold. It's black plastic uh, because, you know, the, the, it's a dramatic kind of Caravaggio background black. So you, the neon words pop forward. If you chose white or clear, it wouldn't be that dramatic. So I wanted the, all of that to be present in the pieces, um, these, these, these pieces of neon that I made, that you see in the photo. Um, but um, thinking about redacting text and how I see neon signs in storefronts that aren't working or flickering on and off and things, one thing's lit up, but the other isn't. Um, that's all a built-in vocabulary um, in the city, I believe, and I'm just using that. Um, so it's familiar to some people, you know, and it's, oh, okay, I understand what's going on there. So yeah. Yeah, and then one last question and um, you know, we'll let you get back to your studio and your work and your time, but I feel like this is a great question because you um, brought it up, but Rodrigo is asking, um, you said you used to be introverted. As an artist, I've always been told to succeed. I have to make contacts and meet important people. Right. Um, what advice do you have to give us um, to, for, for the introverted of us? Um, and is it actually true that you need to um, need people to succeed? Um, you know, kind of talk about your, your, uh, your, your history there and how that works for you. Um, yeah, so like, Rodrigo, like, like, I was super shy, um, ever since, since high school, pretty much. And then, um, you know, I broke out of it probably when I, you know, you had to, and it was more about kind of me, um, you know, just being like a person that wanted to be alone and making work. Um, but I don't know, it, it's just something that I like, you know, especially in my, um, when I started talking about like the work more, you know, it, it, it's the only thing I really know how to do right or, you know, do. So it's like, the, you know, I can know how to talk about this like we're talking now, but you know, there's still, and it's okay to be like introverted, but um, you know, it's okay to like, you know, talk about your work and um, know that you have um, space and you know that your work uh, really kind of needs to be seen and people want to hear about what you have to say um, just knowing that makes you feel more confident or just you know kind of on an even playing field of like no nah, I'm going to tell them how I feel and what, what I'm trying to say there's a way of doing that and you know you don't have to be over the top salesman but you know um, it's just about um, communicating your idea sometimes you'll do it more with your visuals and what you make um, and that's kind of why I probably started making work in the first place when I was a kid um, because I didn't talk so I tried to use the visual as um, communication um, not that I was saying anything but you know I was just drawing like I don't know Spider-Man or whatever but um, yeah I mean it's it's um, it's okay to be that way and it's just at your own time and leisure like you'll 
you'll evolve into whatever you become and whenever you feel healthy and kind of okay being then you know just be that just be yourself and but in terms of connections and stuff like that um i don't know like i i think that that might help and it's probably a good thing to do that i think timing is a lot of it i think a hard there's no there's no you know, substitution for hard work and working, making work and doing things and producing work and ideas, because that will speak, you know, more than anything that you can really say to anybody to convince them to give you some type of show or try to fit into some gallery roster, you know, or trying to copy some, you know, like trying to uh, figure out what the uh, new contemporary uh, trends and, you know, contemporary art trends are when you go to an art fair and try to replicate that. It's just about really honing in your voice and speaking not only just about it, but just in the work. Um, I'm going to share a book with you. I'm going to walk over here. This will help you a lot. I don't know if uh, I'm reading it now, but um, let me turn this around. Sure. Definitely want you to check this out because they talk about that in here. Mm. I also uh, I support that. Uh, I also have been reading Definitely that. a must read, read for everybody, yeah. Um, because, you know, we're talking about, um, they're talking about markets and what actually has to happen in certain, you know, like what actually happened, physically happens and what is being said in galleries and why things aren't happening the way you know, like, you know, opportunities aren't had. Um, and then it's specifically, um, you know, talking about uh, Latinx and then also uh, black artists and all of it. I think it's super valuable that that book exists. It just came out and it's something you should probably look into because it'll give you a lot of insight and it'll, it'll, it'll take, take uh, some weight off your shoulders. That's great. Thank you so much for that great advice. Um, Tim, are you able to add that to the chat? So um, yeah, so I, was, I actually just uh, another oh, uh, perfect. There's a link right there to that particular book. I picked it up at my local bookstore at Broman's. Support local bookstores. Um, uh, you can pick up that copy. Patrick work uh, is featured, and he's in, in conversation and dialogue, so you can read up more about Patrick. I think this about does it on timing. Uh, I, I know we went a little over the hour, so I appreciate everyone who stayed with us over the hour and and and. Uh, definitely thank you, Patrick, uh, for being with us. Uh, it was uh, exciting to have you. It was definitely the highlight of, of, uh, of my day, and I've been looking forward to our conversation. And, and I know that there's many who are with us today, again, who are either staff, faculty, current students at Art Center from our community, and then those who are just tuning in, trying to learn a little bit more about kind of what are the paths that, that one might take while at Art Center. And um, I think you definitely spoke to a variety of audiences tonight. So Thank you once again, Patrick, for being with us. Um, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Liz Lanfear, the Director of Programming and Events in the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion as our co-partner for this evening. And of course, our co-sponsors, the Illustration Department and Fine Art Department. So thank you, Ann Field and Laura Cooper for co-sponsoring this event to be able to hear from one of our own and, and, and touch upon all those different um, uh, themes within his work as well. So. Uh, any any last last comments from you, Patrick, as we wrap up? Um, just everyone, you know, stay healthy. You know, take care of yourselves. Um, at school, if you're attending art center, you know, out of school, just be safe. Thanks, everyone. Make sure to uh, awesome. to follow Patrick on Instagram, Patrick underscore Martinez underscore Studio, um, and also follow Art Center DEI to hear about more upcoming events, including additional events from this particular virtual speaker series. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Cheers, everyone. Tim. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Patrick. Take care.